she talked about how the worst thing you can do is sit down and write every day. Like, you can't do it every day. Okay, yeah, you have to show up and write, but she was like, yeah, the worst thing you can do is try to write every day. You're going to get gassed. Welcome back to The Craft, where we explore the creative process. I'm Carter, a PhD student in literature at the University of Kentucky and a writer. And I'm Colby. I'm a product manager, marketer, and music producer. And today we are going to be talking about creative encouragement, finding the inspiration to continue long projects. What does it look like? What things encourage us? Colby, this was kind of your idea. Do you want to just sketch it out for us? Yeah, I'm really excited to talk through this. So, you know, I've been reading through a book by Stephen Pressfield, a new one that I hadn't read before. And it kind of reminded me that there's a lot of times where I just need a good word, an encouraging word to keep going and to keep showing up. So this episode, the way I think about it is like a note to myself in the future to not give up on that long-term project that I'm working on. That's kind of the way I'm thinking about it. Maybe just sharing things that inspire me whenever I don't feel inspired and kind of hear what things help you through those moments. And maybe this is helpful to someone else too. Yeah, this kind of reminds me of the creative roadblock question that we keep asking guests on the podcast, which has been, I think, a really good question. So I think this is one that we want to get a little more practical with what we do, maybe a little less abstract in this and really kind of hone in on if we're thinking about the creative process pretty much a perennial problem is the creative roadblock. And that looks like, you know, it looks different for everyone and there's kind of different iterations of that. But I think the main thing is, okay, what do we do? What's the, what's the protocol when things are flat and there's no fizz? hundred percent. And so the book I'm reading has the humorous title, put your ass where your heart wants to be. And the basic premise of this book, actually, I just finished it is really just as simple as it sounds. If you want to be a painter, you got to go sit in front of the easel and you have to paint. If you want to be a dancer, you got to be in the dance studio. And so at the most basic level, it's literally this whole book that's just saying, do the thing, (laughs) you know, it's very straightforward, but it was really inspiring just to, to be reminded like, yeah, there's, there's not like complete magic to being a musician. I am working on a music project right now that I won't share the details of, but basically this book really inspired me to keep pushing through that. And at the heart of this book was a very simple message to continue to show up. If you keep showing up, good things happen. At a baseline, if you don't show up, nothing's going to happen. And so the bare minimum is to keep showing up. And almost like there's a segment of the book where he talks about his daily writing practice. So he's written some novels. You know, we talked about him on the Hero's Journey episode, and he's written The War of Art that's obviously super well known. If you're in the creative space listening to this, you've probably already heard that book or read it. And what he talks about in his daily writing practice is essentially he sits down and he just wants to write for a couple hours. He doesn't set a word count expectation. He doesn't set an expectation of how good it's going to be. He just literally tries to sit down and write every day. And I think that the power of what he was describing there is like, getting out of your own way and turning off the judgmental part of your brain and just saying, it doesn't matter if it's bad. I just did it. Like literally it's as simple as I can put an X on the calendar, like Jerry Seinfeld, put an X on the calendar that I did the thing today and I can move on. Did it suck? Maybe. But if you do that, then you put yourself in that position for inspiration to strike, that position for good ideas to show up. It's such a basic thing and we've talked about so many times, but I think it's just worth harping on again. Get out of your own way. Don't judge your work in the moment, but just show up and put in the hours. Yeah, so yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And I think the mindset there of turning off the editor mindset and and, and kind of adopting the creative mindset is really helpful. And yeah, that idea we've talked about, I feel like in, along a couple of different axes. I mean, we've talked about uh, creative compounding, Right, little small incremental changes, the, the Kaizen method, even like Aristotle talking about excellence being a habit. It's something that has to get formed, getting the kind of effort there first and letting the inspiration follow. And so I think at a baseline, one response to the creative roadblock is just sit down or just show up. Like, okay, how do you get through it? Well, you're going to have to kind of just face it in a way. I think it's freeing in a lot of ways to say, okay, this doesn't have to be great work, but the way through is going to be 
through and not around. And so it is just kind of a matter of showing up. Uh, I had a baseball coach one time say, I think he said something like, in life, you will be surprised at how much just showing up does. Like just showing up somewhere to your work, to, you know, something you don't want to do. To Like he's like, that's 70% of being there is just showing up. And I think that was good. It's stuck in my head. And I think it's true for the creative process as well. So let's say we show up and we're still not feeling it. What, what, maybe that's, maybe we do like a triage in this episode. Okay. So I've, I've shown up and it's still, the gears are grinding. The engine's making an awful noise. What's the next move? I think that's an interesting direction to take it just for a second because it's really common and that's like the most common experience. Maybe that's the baseline is <laughs> you're going to show up. You're not going to want to do something. I think that's almost yeah, the that's premise good. of this episode in a way is it's not going to be fun every time. I, I mean, something I wrote down was I think there's a real sense of sometimes r- moving your emotions out of the picture or I think maybe there's a time to move with your emotions and be like, okay, there's just truly so much mental blockage that I can't work right now and be like, okay, I'm okay with that. I'm going to step back and showing up is more high level. Like I'm not going to give up. I'm just going to take a break for a week, a month, six months, but I'm not giving up in the long term. And then in the day to day level, it's more like, I am not feeling this right now. Sometimes it's appropriate to say, that's okay. I'm just going to keep doing it because if this was my day job or if I was working the restaurant job or whatever, it doesn't really matter if you're not feeling it. You still have to wait the table. You still have to serve the food, right? And at the risk of sounding a little brash, I think there's times where as a creative, you can be like, oh, like I need to wait for inspiration or something to where it's like, (laughs) you don't have to wait for inspiration to make a meal for someone. And if we give ourselves too many outs, then we can almost like give into a laziness where sometimes you do have to sit down and set a minimum. I'm going to I'm going to sit in this chair for 1 hour. Like literally if I do nothing else I sat in the place in front of the keyboard and maybe I just played a few notes. But sort of setting like a requirement to show up is one idea. Another could be the Rick Rubin idea of okay, you can't write a whole verse right now. No worries. Come back tomorrow with one word that you like. The last thing I'll say is like sometimes I think with procrastination a really helpful framework that I heard with Matt Vella on his YouTube channel was normally there's two reasons you're procrastinating. One is the task is too overwhelming, too big. So you don't really know where to get started. Your brain is just like, can't compute. And then the other one is you're bored. And it's like, I don't want to do this thing. It's just so tedious. So if it's too big, you do the Rick Rubin and you break it down. And if it's too boring, then you put a spin on it. I'm going to make this project in a different genre. Or kind of like these Jet GBT prompts, right? It's like, make this song in the style of X. So those are like three big things, but that was a lot. What do you think? Yeah, so I, I really I agree with all this. This is a big affirmation. I'm trying to think if we take a step back on, on what we're talking about here. Okay, we've got a roadblock. We've got something. There's changes that we can make either in our approach to how we see the project, right? Breaking it into a smaller idea, understanding that there's multiple components. So we can change our approach or we can kind of change the conditions in which we do the project. Like for me, oftentimes when I'm doing something I don't want, like grading or something, I'll say, okay, after one paper I grade, I'll go refill my coffee. Or after like two papers, I'll go check Substack or something briefly, you know? And so it's something that's like, oh, okay, I can kind of do these little things that my mind knows that I'm doing, but it just changes the conditions. Or like if I'm going to do, I don't hate grading as much as it sounds like, <laughs> but I've just used that as like, that's one that's you kind of have to really push through. Yeah, I'll try to change the conditions. Like I'll try to, you know, have a candle going or have a glass of wine with me or, or do something that's like, oh no, I'm going to make the conditions in which I'm doing something really, really pleasant and like trick myself into thinking, oh no, this is a pleasant thing to do. This is like me sitting back with a novel I've been wanting to read. You know, this is just a different task in a different condition. And so for me, oftentimes it's kind of trying to stagger things, get through this and then you can go outside or get through this and then you can go do this chore and just listen to a podcast. And so that's, to me, I think that's like changing the conditions of it, but also you also have that changing the approach to it. Maybe I'm just not looking at it correctly. And I think that's that's the big deal, I think, on the ones that aren't boredom. Like the one that's too big to manage, I totally get that. And I think that needs 
not better conditions, but you actually need to have a different approach to it. That's where I'm kind of gravitating. So those there's changing your conditions, changing your approach. I mean, and if we zoom back again, sort of like to the core, it's the first thing in this triage is like, okay, I'm feeling unmotivated or I'm feeling blocked. There's maybe multiple kinds of blockage too going further back. It's like you can be globally just, I don't know if I'm a musician anymore. It's been a long time since I've made a project. Yeah, yeah. I don't have any songs I'm working on. I've felt that a lot before. You could be stuck on a specific project. I don't know how to make this third song out of a five song EP work. And then maybe there's like, or I'm stuck in a super specific area of my craft, like in music going deeper. I'm not super good at theory and I'm kind of stuck there. And do I want to spend the time investing and getting better at that? Maybe there's even more, but those are like three categories I can think of for where the problem could be happening. And then based on what kind of problem it is, it's going to definitely be a different response. Okay, good. This is really helpful. Okay, so let's let's pick our own adventure here. I think, you know, we've got the idea of creative roadblocks. I was just trying to make a connection, but we're not... We're not really talking about that. I think we're talking about, a spe- are we talking about a specific problem of I'm lacking inspiration or are we talking about like these different kinds of being blocked? Because we can talk about all of them or we can hone in on the problem of I lack inspiration because that's different than how do I do song three on the track? What do I need to do to kind of get the wheels turning? This episode originally started in my head as like, I'm stuck on this specific project, help, you know, but I think where it actually should go is let's spend a little bit of time on each of those buckets. Let's spend a little, what helps you whenever you feel like, I don't want to be a writer anymore. I'm not good at this. What helps you on the level of the project and what helps you on the level of like, I need to get better at sentence structure yeah. or something that's okay, really I like specific. Those. So like, those are the kind of three buckets. Okay, reiterate those one more time to me. So let's say like, there's like global, like, your Who creative identity I? almost. Yes. And then you have your project level roadblock. Skill and then you set have level your, or something. Uh, skill level. Yeah. Perfect. Identity, project, skill set. There we go. I'm putting that in the description. Let's start in the identity one. What helps you when you're in that place of saying, you know, I don't know if I can do this thing in writing anymore. I'm just going to step back from it for a while. Sometimes that's the right thing to do, but then... Do you ever get to that place or do you feel like that that bucket is one you don't spend as much time in? That's a good question. I feel like I don't spend as much time wondering whether I'm a writer, whether I need to be a writer, these sort of things. And I think part of that is just I'm constantly, and this is kind of the answer to the question, I'm constantly reading things that inspire me. Like reading is such a huge part of everything that I do. So when I'm reading something, Mm -hmm. it's like an invitation into a tradition. So I feel like I'm constantly getting invitations into traditions all the time. It's like every the writers I'm reading are like, yeah, they're like welcoming welcoming me in a way, or at least how I'm considering it. And so for me, that lack of a broader motivation is in some ways remedied by going to great art that moves me and going to the things that remind me of of what I want to try to accomplish. But also I feel like sometimes it can be a bit more corrosive in that I can take for granted what being a writer means and I can kind of have a small view of it. And I think that falls into this bucket of not recognizing kind of the, for lack of a better word, nobleness of the task. I mean, one of the things I talked to my students about is how little of the world was literate. Just 200 years ago, in 1820, there's only 12% of the world could read. I mean, it, it's it's pretty incredible. I mean, in the same year, nearly 94% of the whole <laughs> Earth's population lived in poverty. And so even today, we've got like 85% of the world living on less than $30 a day. And so it's easy to kind of understand what we're doing outside of the long arc of history. And so for me, it's really inspiring to say, not only can I read, which is the statistical outlier in human history, if I was just to put a, a dot somewhere on the timeline, the odds are I won't be able to read. It's very, very recent that we have got wide range literacy. And so not only can I read, but I have a economic system in which I can read and write 
and not have the sustenance farm. It's like, so like nine hours of my day is not hoping that I can raise enough food that I won't starve to death. And so you can just go on and on in this, and then all of a sudden you recognize, whoa, what I'm doing is incredible. And for me, that's really helpful in this kind of global concern of, you know, if I'm feeling like, I don't know, if I'm being tired with what I'm doing, I think that may be the one that I have to deal with in this global. It's like getting tired of this. Those sort of broader reminders and invitations from from others and and, and looking elsewhere can be really impactful. So I'll, I'll say those two. So one, it's like, just the act of reading and two is grounding yourself in the history of your discipline. Sure. Yeah. That's a good way to say it. Yeah. It's, it's blown my mind a few times thinking about how recording audio is only a couple hundred years old and music production is like a hundred years old or, you know, probably a little more than that. So that is a, that's honestly a helpful thing to, to remember. I'll share a couple quick things on this for me. I would say one, I struggle with this one more in this high level sort of like, because I work in, you know, marketing, product management now, music, it's kind of like I've got my hands in a couple of different things. And so it's sort of depends on the week, like what am I focused on and most excited about? And so I think that that can lead me to feel like, oh, what am I really pursuing? And am I doing music still? Like it's sort of this thing that I do on the side. So I feel this one a little more, but something that's been helpful for me has just been even recently, I picked up one of the Austin Cleon books and he has a section that talks about people want to be the noun without doing the verb. You know, they want to be the writer without writing, the photographer without taking photos. And so an easy sort of reversal of that framework is just to be like, you know, if I'm thinking, am I a musician still? It's like, well, if I want to be, I should just go sit down and make a song right now. And I am a exactly. musician. Exactly. So good. Yeah. Am I a Grammy winning artist? No. And that's totally fine. Like, but that doesn't mean I throw the towel in on music. Just keep making music. And sometimes you take a three month break. That's okay. You know, the other quote here that's helpful is if art imitates life, then you have to have a life to make art. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure who originally said that. I might have heard it on the Design Matters podcast, but that's a great quote. And you've said something to that effect too, which is just, you know, sometimes you need to live your life. Yeah. So honestly, the the phrase keeps showing up, I think, can apply on the day-to-day -le -day -le -day level, but also on the the year-to-year -year level. Like, are you just, did you pick up the guitar one time this year? I think that one more throw. I want to give a shout out to this Substack negative space. You can look at edition seven from Andy Grandstaff. He's got this post about falling back in love with photography. I think that's a really good post about this issue of, I sort of fell out of love with my craft at a high level. And so how do I just get re-inspired to do the thing, to write, to take photos, to make music? And he gives some really practical ones, taking a break from social media, putting away the camera or whatever your tool is and sort of like forcing yourself to not be allowed to do it can actually maybe sort of create a desire to make art again. And I won't share all the rest, but go read. There's like a list of five or six tactical things that he gives that are really good. So check out Negative Space. We'll put a link in the description. Yeah, definitely go subscribe. So those are some of the things that I think help me. Yeah, two things come to mind. One, I think it was Annie Dillard, uh, the environmental writer, she talked about how the worst thing you can do is sit down and write every day. Like, you can't do it every day. <laughs> and so here's a great writer who's like, okay, yeah, you have to show up and write. But she was like, yeah, the worst thing you can do is try to write every day. You're going to get gassed. Like, you don't have enough juice, basically. And I think that's true, too. So it's like showing up. I love how you're saying it. it's not just that you do it every day. It's like, but are you actually showing up in a broader way? And so it doesn't have to mean this like mechanical thing, but it, it has kind of some more layers to it. And the other thing I was just reminded of is I think these buckets too, we're all going to be different in how we interact with them. So like you trying to figure out where you are in music is something that you spend a lot of time thinking of where I don't spend as much time thinking about that level. But on the other hand, I was just thinking about this today when I was like getting a bite to eat. I was like, Colby's got one of the most meticulous systems like for his schedule, for his work. I mean, he just must be a pleasure to work with because he's always on top of all these details. And Cassie will tell you that I am beyond not on top of these details, right? It's like I struggle with, and we're going to get to this bucket in a minute, getting through the practical things that need to get done, having the systems in place to to move around things. And so that's 
that's a bucket that I have issues with. So I think for our listeners, like you, you may like think about where you are in these buckets. Like what, what's the, what's the one that's kind of difficult? Is it the actually getting through the the checklist? Is it knowing why you should bother with the checklist in the first place? Is it advancing? Because I do think like different seasons of life, different personalities, like the buckets will look different. And so I was just going to throw that out there too. That's encouraging to hear. I think that's totally true. So the next one is project level roadmaps. You've got a novel you're working on. You've got a paper. You've got a an album. And maybe there's a specific piece of that project that's holding you back. Or there's maybe multiple layers to this when you're either stuck like, I just don't want to keep working on this EP. Or, you know, song three is like, I'm not sure what to do next. What do you think helps you in this category? Okay, this is one that... With that bit of a prelude, this is one that I have a difficult time with. You know, I often feel like I'm, my wheels are spinning on stuff sometimes. If I don't have a clear, like I can, I can get paralyzed in thinking of something like a dissertation of like, what do I need to do today? <laughs> right? It's like, do I need to do more drafting? Do I need to do, you know, do I need to spend more time with my text? Do I need to read some secondary literature on this? Do I need to go for a long walk? Is that productive? Like for me, this is a tough one, and. You know, I'm not very good at checklists and to-do lists to my detriment. And so for me, it's hard to it's hard to pin down exactly what I need to do. So this is definitely a bucket that I struggle with. And I think for me, dude, whether or not it's good or bad, my knee-jerk reaction is just do something. <laughs> like do something that's going to in some way move in the right direction. And so I think I could benefit from having some more go-to systems here, but for me, it is just kind of this Nike style of like, well, if I don't know whether I need to draft or need to read, it's like, well, do one of them because it's going to contribute in some way. And so oftentimes, I think this kind of goes back to what we talked at the very beginning of this episode of like, just show up, make some sort of movement in the right direction and you know, have some sort of faith in the process. Maybe a good thing to tie in with that is I feel like if you have a combination of just do something and just keep showing up and deadlines, good stuff's going to happen because then you're like, okay, well, crap, <laughs> this thing's due in three this days. So good. Yeah. What do I need to do? I'll figure it out. Just do, 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 do. I'll do the stuff. It, there's just something that motivates about deadlines and that it's a classic art is not finished. It's just abandoned, right? Sure. And so- you got to have deadlines if you're going to abandon it. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you don't have that second piece, which is a clear deadline or clear goal, like it can be really disorienting, right? Or or even you can, in some ways, right. I don't know, there may be a ways in which I know what I ought to do, but I don't want to do it. And so I pretend I don't know exactly. Like, you know, it's like I could break down the writing process into steps and follow them. And it's not always a linear thing. And so I'll give myself some, some slack on that. But yeah, I mean, it's I mean, tough say, this is what needs to happen. I mean, that's not always evident. You know, what needs to happen in what order? How do I need to stack those? And I think that layering of deadlines and objectives is really important here. Like, break it down. I mean, back to the Rick Rubin thing. Right? Break it down to the one word. Break it down to what needs to happen. And because it's got to get more concrete. And I think that's where I struggle, getting down to the concrete of what needs to get done. And if we're just talking about inspiration, like you're not inspired about the project anymore let's say so let's switch it up you're working on a zine and you're feeling that on that lack of inspiration for it i think one thing that helps is to go back to the moments that you got excited about a project which which sometimes is seeing someone else drop a zine watching someone else drop the album and being like man it's so cool to like be able to post that the new album is out and share the link and to see it in Spotify and to like look through the track list and they chose the way that they should capitalize the words and they have like a specific cover art and they do this whole there's this whole world around building an album or the zine might have different things with it and going back to or maybe it was a trip you were on and you had this moment in the car where you were like I'm going to make this project going back to those genesis moments and trying to remember why you were excited in the first place or kickstart why you were excited by looking at what's what new music is coming out. Like sometimes I just hear a new song and I'm like, man, I want to put music out just because this is such a fun moment of listening to a song and having that first time experience. Because I think the hard part about being an artist or creating anything in life, whether it's a product or a business or anything, is 
another Matt Diavella quote that I like. He's like, making YouTube videos is not the same feeling as watching YouTube videos. <laughs> like, it's fun to watch YouTube videos. It's not as fun to make them. And so you have to sort of go back to like the watching and the, the receiving part to be like, oh man, I want someone else to feel like this when they hear my album. So that's probably, that's on the inspiration thing, biggest thing for me in the projects. Just remember why you started it. Go back and look at inspiration from other things that you like in that same genre. And then one more thing I'll share is from the Stephen Pressfield book, The Office is Closed. This has been really helping me recently. You know, he talks about how he has a really strict rule. When he finishes his writing, he closes the office door and he doesn't keep thinking about his writing. He doesn't talk about his writing to anyone else. He's super strict about it because he just wants to let his subconscious do the work. He wants to let it unfold. I think that for me, I'm someone who obsesses and just constantly thinks about it to I'm like, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do this. That kind of stuff is super easy to do with a project. And so just choosing to like have this combination of I'm going to sit down I'm going to do stuff I'm going to set a deadline and then I'm going to just stop thinking about it. Like I'm just literally going to cut myself off. I'm not allowed to talk about the project right now. I think that could be a good recipe for cutting out all the sort of self-sabotage and sort of person, like emotional pieces of it a little bit, not making this a cold exercise, but making it something where you don't, you sort of protect against your, your worst attributes of just like giving up on something or getting in your own way. Yeah. I mean, this reminds me of like Cormac McCarthy talking about how the unconscious works and whether or not you think that the unconscious functions in this way, there's, there's this long, rich tradition of, inspiration, the muse, something happening that's not you fixating on a detail. Even like Sabbath rest. Yeah, like a place to breathe. Like this is just, I think, really helpful because while you're fixating on it consciously, you're not kind of mulling over it, digesting it. I mean, there's a million metaphors we use for this, but there's something that happens when something lies dormant for a little while that's important. And so I think this is so good, not only just for mental health, but also for, you know, letting the thing happen, which is the thing that's unspeakable, <laughs> you know, whatever that is. Yes, 100%. I've honestly only been trying this more strictly for like a week, but I really like it. It's honestly something I've done for a long time at my main day job where I'm just like, I'm paid to think about this during the day, so I'm not going to think about it at night. But because I'm obsessed about my personal project, I think about it always. And having that self, same self-control, treating it more like a professional job, it's like, I shouldn't think about this right now because it's, it's done. The work is over. Let's move on. So now we're at the skill set level. Roadblocks could be a lack of inspiration or it could be a super practical thing that's blocking you. But how do you think about this one? Two things come to mind. One, in regards to skill, let's just say, Many of the things that allow you to do the thing that you love are not fun to practice. And this is the practicing the scales on guitar, right? Practicing arpeggios. Not fun in themselves, but they're that which allows you to do what you want to do in the first place. So I think connecting the individual mundane practices to something where you can recognize, oh, this is in order that I can do this, and making that connection really clear that there's a purpose for this specific skill set is really helpful for me, right? Always trying to have the end goal in mind while working on something that's, let's say it's just memorization. Recently, I've, I've been memorizing all these different rhetorical forms from epizuxis and hyperbaton and prolepsis and epistrophe and anaphora and simplos and like on and on and on. Some really fun sounding ones like prosopopoeia and uh, homeotolutin. But these are, these are just rote memorization, but they're part of what I think being a English professor is. Like I think sometimes we, this is my soapbox for a minute, sometimes English is seen as a discipline that lacks like a specific breadth of knowledge Right, it can get really in on like the taste, and I think taste is a huge part of like recognizing, you know, great literature is a matter of taste. But there's also a body of knowledge to be learned, just like you take a a midterm in a chemistry class, and there's knowledge to be learned. Like I'm helping teach an American lit class, the professor helpfully has a midterm and final because. He told me there's knowledge to be learned here. Like, this is not just write two papers for this class. 
read these works. No, it's learn the material. And so I think there's not as much attention on the really boring parts, the mechanics of language anymore. And so I'm trying to learn those. I'm trying to learn the the mechanics in a way that is connected to the broader idea of what I'm doing. So I think anytime I can make that connection is helpful. I feel like that's similar to what I've been thinking of, which is just almost like project-based learning or reverse engineering. There are two things, semi-related concepts that I've done, which is like, for one, if I'm trying to get better at music, I've just tried remaking existing songs. There's a website called copythat.com. I'm pretty sure that's the URL. And it's basically bundling up and explaining this idea that, you know, Ben Franklin like took excellent writing and he wrote it out himself. And basically just the whole practice of copywriting, like literally taking someone else's copy and then taking a piece of paper or a computer and typing it out yourself to learn this is how it feels to make good writing. Same thing with music. You sort of get an understanding like, oh, this is, oh, interesting. Like if I'm going to make this sound match the recording of the original, the reverb I thought was really loud, but it's actually a lot quieter. Maybe I should use reverb quieter or in this different way. You start to pattern match. It's like sort of technical work, but it's done through the lens of, reverse engineering. The other one is project-based. So instead of just saying, I'm going to learn more chords, connecting it to a project you're working on, say, I'm going to spend an hour, I'm going to try to learn one or two new chords, and I'm going to try to incorporate it into a song. I'm going to make a song with these new chords, turns it into an exercise where you're not just learning scales, you're learning, I'm going to play this scale in a specific song. And so you just directly connect it to one use case. And then I think that's a little bit more tractable than I'm going to learn all these scales and I'm going to memorize 12 of them. And then we'll see when I use them down the road. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I've heard John Mayer talk a lot about like playing guitar. He's like, yeah, whenever you go learn a lick, like learn the thing that makes that lick work, not the thing itself. And I totally didn't do that. So like my guitar playing as a layman suffers because I just always learned the lick, right? I learned the solo, I learned the opening, whatever. I never learned that which made the thing work. And that's really great because that's what we want to do in our crafts, right? You want to learn why a principle works. But I think the thing that I'm realizing is we also have to learn the thing itself. And so I think the emphasis in my realm is learning the, the thing that makes the principle work. And there's less emphasis on learning the principle, right? There, there's more on the global and there's less on the local. So I have to bring myself to learn more and more local because we spend a lot of time thinking about global and not as much on local. For guitar playing, I mistakenly just learned the practical and the local without learning the global principle that underlies it. So you learned the solo instead of the scale. Yeah, or I learned the scale instead of like why the scale is a scale, like the theory side of it, like the, the underpinning of it. And so if I was to go and want to develop as a guitar player, I'd need to go back and learn these global principles. In my realm of writing, there's a lot of time spent talking about global principles. So arrangement, style, evidence, structure, these sort of things. But there's not as much emphasis talking about something like, let's say, chiasmus, which is really tactical, where you've got, you know, the famous John F. Kennedy, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. So it's an A, B, B, A structure. It's like, that's really practical. And there's not as much attention on that. That would be like learning the guitar lick without knowing, okay, well, what is he doing? Well, he's trying to make something memorable and he's trying to make something stick in the audience's mind. And he's, you know, he's inverting this and he's using the interesting form to help emphasize a point. Like those are the global things he's doing, but we don't know it's called chiasmus anymore, but we need to know that. And so it's, it's kind of, for me, there are inverse areas that need attention. That clarifies it for sure. I don't know that I have anything else to add on that. I think there's definitely, skill set is the least sexy of these. It's like the one that's like, ah, you just got to put in more work on the fundamentals. It, it's kind of that basic idea of like, you always go back to the fundamentals, whether it's yoga or music or anything. You got You can't move too far beyond them because they impact everything else. I'm going to start putting in a little tab. This is a joke. I'm not really going to do this, but start putting in a tab of like Colby's explanation of Carter's two minute monologue. It's like, I just skip that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put that in the chapters. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this was good. I feel like we got a lot on the table here. There's a lot here. I think this was helpful just to organize our thoughts sure, around this, this topic. And I think we could do a part two someday to even clean it up again because there's probably 
angles or things we miss. I'd love to hear feedback from others on this. But I look forward to when I'm not inspired going back and listening to this episode and pulling out just one idea, yeah, kind of picking so it off the shelf and then applying it. One last thing before we go, though, I do need to wrap, but I'd like to do a, a bonus segment today, which is Carter reacts to a new creative tool. So there's this thing I found this week kind of randomly. I got this email from Lightphone because I'm on their email list and they're doing this like giveaway with this company called Freewrite. So go to getfreewrite.com, F-R-E-E-W-R-I-T-E. And they are creating some really interesting products. So they've got two products here. They've got the Traveler and the Smart Typewriter. So because this is audio only, I'm just going to do a little descriptor here. It kind of looks like this sort of super clean, minimalistic, like light phone version of a typewriter that's digital or basically like this super dumbed down laptop. Like it's like laptop fold up style. You've got the keyboard. Yeah. It's like all white, really small e-ink screen, like a Kindle in the middle of it with no trackpad. It looks like it might have one of those old trackpad thingies, like on the IBM computers, you know, the oh, little yeah, red yeah, thing. Yeah. And then they've got this other one that's like, not doesn't fold this big black it's got the same ink screen in the middle and then really tactile fat keys version this thing is sweet the first one that's called the traveler the second one's called the smart typewriter light and portable distraction free drafting under two pounds backs up to the cloud so it looks like it's digital you can move to the cloud which is cool there's some really great photos on here showing you know people in these really nice environments just like riding with a cup of coffee working on their novel or whatever. What What's the kind of gut reaction? Like, I just want to hear what you think about this, dude. Were you the one that sent me that one wooden bespoke typewriter thing? Or like, oh, it was yeah. like the beautiful computer? What was that called? Yes. It's called Mythic Computer Company. Yes, yes. Mythic.computer is the website. Because I loved that, but I don't have thousands of dollars to buy one of those. This seems more approachable than that one. So basically, what do you think about this tool? How would it help? How would it hurt potentially? Are you going to buy one one day? Or if you, you know, would you use it if you had one right now? Like all those kind of questions. What do you think? All right. Right off, this is totally live reaction. I love the design. I think I especially like the ones that are a little bulkier. So they've got like a, uh, the signature edition Heming- Hemingway edition. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't see that. that. Uh, But the smart typewriter, I like the design. And here's the thing I love. It's doing what I already like some applications do. So in Word and in Scrivener, you can click a button and go focus mode where you pull out all the bars, you pull out everything, and you only have the Word document. However, if you're not careful, right, you get a little banner popping up on your uh, screen that's why it's text you or notification, right? Notifications are the... Gosh, we love them, but they, they're awful for us, right? They're, they're destroying our focus. And so I love that this pulls that away. I love that you have an item that's physical and tangible that's dedicated to writing, like a typewriter. I've had a lot of fun pulling out the typewriter lately and working through drafts. But however, you have to go back and retype them on the computer if you're going to do anything with them. <laughs> and this is kind of helpful because you get to rewrite things. But this is really nice. It uploads it. It's a nice design. Distraction free? Yeah, distraction free offline, or I guess it's not offline because you can upload, but there's no Facebook, no Instagram, no sort of big distractors or notifications. So that seems really promising. But it really does yeah. feel like the light phone version of like a, f- a laptop almost. I'm loving this. Dude, the Hemingway one comes with a, I guess it has to have batteries and charge. I guess that's the only downside, but that's the that's the trade off. $9.99 for the Hemingway version. Looks yeah. like they start at maybe four ninety nine, I think. Maybe yeah, I think the other ones are a little cheaper. The LCD. It's kind of like a Kindle screen, which I like too. Like it's matted. Mm-hmm. Really nice design. I love this. I'm a hundred percent a fan. This may be. This is. I don't know. This is going to be a temptation now. This. <laughs> oh, here's one. You can get the the basic Alpha. What is this? This little one for like three hundred bucks. Pre order three twenty nine. Yeah, that's not bad. Pre order. I mean, that's a that and that one's interesting. That one looks kind of like I don't know. It's just got this really small sliver key sliver screen at the top. It looks like catchphrase or something. <laughs> you pass yes, around. catchphrase. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah, it totally looks like catchphrase. I think that's cool. There's it just reduces you down to this is the tool that I'm using. You go from the sort of all in one Mac to exactly the one in one. You know, just getting down to like that's it. 
the thing that I want to do. And there's so many distractions that it seems like a pretty promising tool, but that was fun. Check out getfreeride.com. Yeah. Let's get a sponsorship. <laughs> yeah. Hit us up, <laughs> Freeride free or Life Phone. You want a full episode? We'll give you a full episode. <laughs> That's right. We will. Awesome. Dude, this is great. That's the pod. Excellent. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. If you like this episode, please follow the show so that you get notified about the new ones that come out. We drop a new episode every two weeks on Wednesday mornings. And also just please send the link to one friend that you think would enjoy this interview. That helps us so much. Lastly, if you have any ideas for other people we should have on the show, topics we should talk about, or even just feedback on how we can improve, you can send us an email at heycraftpodcast at gmail.com. Cover art was designed by Elizabeth Newell. You can learn more about her work at elizabethnewell.work or on Instagram at elizabethisadesigner. Thanks for listening. See you in two weeks.